Welcome back, everyone. This is uh, Orlando Stoics, Friday night. And um, we still have people entering the room. Um, but tonight, the topic is uh, Stoicism and your character. And uh, I'll be here um, uh, giving a little introduction with my friend Joe Bullock. Uh, we're going to review uh, not just uh, parts of chapter three of How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. That's the book by Donald Robertson. But we're also going to cover some interesting parts of Stoicism. And I've looked up things in psychology today and the IEP to back up the history that, um, that Donald Robertson has told, because it's a very specific history. And it starts, uh, by the way, uh, in a very interesting point. Chapter three begins with the idea that um, uh, he's talking about how Marcus Aurelius, at the beginning of chapter three, how Marcus was uh, affected by the two emperors that preceded him, Hadrian and Antoninus Pius. And these two characters, Hadrian was kind of on the hot side, hot tempered, and um, the Antoninus was more gentle and moderate. And so these two characters uh, were kind of like a mentor, you might say, Instead of having one character, he had two contrasting characters uh, who affected him. And these, again, were the emperors who preceded Marcus. So, um, uh, you know, Joe, last week we talked about uh, contrast as being one teaching tool. I thought that that was a really important point and formation of actually understanding uh, his own person, the, the reason, what would his, uh, what, how detrimental his own anger could be in a particular situation. I think the Hadrian uh, incident that we will, will cover where he actually took the eye out of a slave uh, horrified everybody. And in those types of experiences can make you ask and wonder what drives a person to do that. And it drives your own personal introspection are you capable of doing that? And I think you can see the idea of virtue being very important to Marcus early on so that he would ha often have to guard against that. And he was grateful to the gods that he never lost his temper to a point where he would have regretted it. And I think you saw that throughout his role as well. So mm -hmm. Now, in addition to this contrast of Hadrian and Antoninus, the um, two different characters. You know, just last week we had really good luck with a, a different kind of metaphor. We were talking about Stoicism and Star Trek. And one of the articles we reviewed had a very intriguing idea, which was the idea that Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in the original series could have been Gene Roddenberry taking one character and splitting it into three people. Now, this is very intriguing because Spock is the logical one, McCoy is the emotional one, and Kirk, of course, as the leader, has to kind of bring it all together. Uh, so this is, you know, this example of Hadrian and, and Antoninus is like a looking without ourselves, uh, and the Kirk, Spock, and McCoy is like looking within. We can see these differences or these contrasts, and we can make better decisions with examples like this. And, yeah, and, you know, the one thing that you see is then is the, the number of people that have actually impacted um, uh, Marcus's life and his ability to take the qualities of those individuals to see what they they were providing him, his tutors specifically. Uh, and this and we'll actually we'll see the impact that Rusticus had on him. Uh, which was a tutor that that was, you know, essentially teaching him virtue, the importance of virtue and having a philosophy of life and was introducing him to stoicism. And you start to see how, you know, Marcus actually gravitated towards this virtue, but he was also being trained in other things in metaphysics and, and being trained in, in, uh, uh, you know, science and math and things along those lines. And uh, that those, the, you know, that he actually gravitated more towards the virtue 
teachings because he realized how important that was to having a tranquil mind. And I, that kind of came out in this chapter for me. Yeah, I like the point that Donald Robertson made about how Rusticus taught Marcus Aurelius about reconciling with other people, you know, after an argument or after conflict, the importance of reconciling with them. And, you know, I, I was thinking about in the modern day, we sometimes have young adults, both men and women, who maybe get advice from their parents, but are rebellious and who are uh, not just rebellious and saying, you know, defensive, I'm not going to change, but also they could be that way for years before they realize the value of that advice. And yet here we have the character of Marcus Aurelius, maybe he was 25 at the time, something like that. I think that was mentioned in the chapter that he really took to this advice by Rusticus and uh, really wanted to embody the life of a Stoic. Absolutely. And, and, and that actually, you know, essentially he even had the, the line that jumped out at me is that he even more than being a Roman emperor wanted to be a philosopher. Uh, and somebody that led a more contemplative, contemptible, uh, con contemplative life. Uh, and, um, and, you know, this comes back to the, he just started to realize the importance of knowing himself. And you see that come through in the rest of the chapter uh, with his physician, uh, Galen was a really important influence as well. Uh, that he spoke about the importance of self-knowledge in addition to his own personal health. And he, I think Marcus recognized the importance of balancing his mental health as well as his uh, physical health and the, and the relationship between those two. Hmm. Well, that's a great point. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about Galen. Uh, for those of you who've studied this Hellenistic period in history, uh, Galen was a famous uh, physician at the time, but Galen is also listed in the IEP. They have a great article about his life, that he was a polymath, he liked mathematics, he liked biology, and uh, some think, some of the scholars think that Galen's interest in philosophy was, um, came about through his interest in biology and his study of the natural world. Isn't that amazing? I mean, we can all think about how we found philosophy the first time. There was some gateway, maybe a great thinker, maybe a field of science, but we all have those uh, entrees. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting how he came from the, you know, the physical sciences and then arrived at philosophy uh, and how important a philosophy of life is. Uh, and it, it, that's somebody that truly is a polymath and understands um, the importance of looking within. And I think we'll see that for the rest of this chapter too, uh, where we, we start to understand where we need somebody uh, to be an observer of ourselves uh, to really help, help us understand ourselves and, and, and to understand our blind spots um, when we're assessing ourselves in order to improve the way we're um, to live a, a more virtuous life. Hmm. Now, next, let's go to Arian, another important influence on uh, Marcus Aurelius. You know, I like the way Donald describes him in this chapter that he had certain uh, military or government offices under the uh, Emperor Hadrian, but then later he uh, was like retired or semi retired under Antoninus. But interestingly, by the time Marcus came along as emperor, his tutors were recommending Arian's writings, which of course we know he took down all the notes from Epictetus and his classes. So it was kind of like a lucky uh, series of events that allowed these writings from Arian to come into the hands of Marcus. And, um, and of course, Marcus was not only looked, uh, looked upon it as interesting Stoic teaching, but also we have to remember that Arian at the time had a great reputation. He was known as a successful military person, but also a very philosophical guy. So that's the right combination for Marcus. What do you think? Uh, I think that that's a really important point because not only being, but the military side is practical and then you have the philosophical side. 
and Stoicism isn't, as this uh, chapter specifically calls out, is not a pen and ink philosophy. It is a way of living. And it's, that's where you take the practical and you take the philosophical and you're kind of combining the two. And that is what has essentially uh, attracted Marcus to Stoicism. Hmm. So. Good. Another important uh, uh, person we can't leave out is Aristo and how right. his writings uh, really made uh, Marcus question himself. I was reading through the literature on this and um, basically we would equate it today to tough love. You know, that uh, tough love that a parent might give to their child or a mentor to a mentee. Um, but um, uh, according to psychology today, tough love in our current culture can have bad effects as well as good effects. It's a very a uh, fine line, as you say, to navigate. How tough should you be on someone? Uh, I mean, in my personal life, I know that I give out equal amounts of praise and maybe criticism. Some people even think that when I talk about criticism that I'm using too tough a word, criticism, you know, that I should find a softer word for that. But that's, um, constructive criticism is really how I uh, mean it. And, um, I don't know. What, what do you think about this, this balancing act? I think it's the most important part of this uh, chapter in the sense of how to correct somebody. And they talk about that and not to necessarily come out and speak bluntly, but to do it tactfully. If you really want to get the response that, you, you know, from someone to actually understand what they may be doing wrong. And I think that that kind of criticism is really important to be able to do because many times that if you just correct somebody, they take offense to it and then they actually regress and then and it, it strains the relationship. But if you're able to do it tactfully, if you're able to correct somebody and he, you know, Marcus uh, was grateful. He always found that Alexander, who is his childhood grammarian, had a way of correcting somebody and weaving it into the conversation and not embarrassing them. And I actually have seen this, you know, with many of the Sto uh, members in the modern Stoic movement, including the author of the book, uh, Donald Robertson. I asked him a question and my, one of my assumptions were, was false. Um, but he didn't say that right away. He said, great question. And then he went through a logical sequence and beautifully let me know where my logic was faulty. And at the same time, uh, you know, he was, he, he was able to earn my trust because at that point I said, wow, that was really, really kind of him because he could have said, no, that's wrong and moved on. But he was very actually gracious in how he did it. Uh, so I, I, you can see actually the author of the book practicing what he's written. And that was a firsthand experience that I had that I, I, I really appreciated. But I think that's a lesson for all of us in how we're, when we're talking to someone, nobody really wants to know that how much we know or what we're, we're quote unquote right about. They want to know that we can, you know, uh, that we can correct them with kindness and hopefully they're receptive and, and, uh, and, that they can trust us not to embarrass them or something, you know, and make them feel um, a little bit more uh, comfortable with their position. So Good. now that leads us to the, the middle of this chapter where Donald Robertson talks about judging others. And um, for those of you following along in the book, by the way, this is about page 89. And I think that Donald had a very expressive idea here when, when he said that uh, if we see the faults in others, that we actually make a blind spot for ourselves. So in other words, we're so busy judging someone else that we don't see the faults in ourselves. And this is a, a great uh, point of clarity. It's another great tool for modern stoicism and our practice. And you know, the other uh, part of this, chapter that I really appreciated was where he spoke about how Plato said we have a blind spot for the ones that we love. And, you know, that's an also a very important point that we'll come across. Um, and that uh, 
if we care about ourselves, then we're going to have a blind spot for ourselves as well. So that it kind of that has that correlation there. So that we ought to have somebody that is that we can trust, that we can speak to um, truthfully, and they'll give us our honest feedback. And hopefully we receive that feedback and it starts to build the, the um, case, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, as to why sages or people that are the ideal, that ideal role models are important. Hmm. So as he wraps up the first half of this chapter, uh, I noticed that he really brings a good argument forward about cultivating one's character. Because he started with obvious things like Marcus, you know, dealt with anger like all of us and goes through these various tools. Um, but that's when you really accumulate all these tools, I think your stoic practice not only gets better, but one's character through, uh, truly gets uh, more cultivated. That is, you're not, just, um, you're not just going through the world with one or two tools that you can apply to things. You've got a wide variety of tools to help you with many situations. And um, that's what other philosophers talk about, you know, is that we should seek to cultivate our character. Some of the existentialists did that in the 50s and the 60s. I, I, the importance of character, I think, really had come out with the idea of how a, the relationship between a, um, a uh, patient and their therapist, you know, you need the patient to be honest. And they have they. It's a prerequisite, or in a trusting relationship, to, for someone to be objectively criticizing you, you have to be honest. And honesty is a virtue, so that these virtues are actually critical to getting the feedback that you need to make yourself better. So that that pursuit of virtue, in that case, being honest, uh, justice, if you will. Um, is actually critical to your own well-being. And it kind of shows how the, the virtues are for, for our own benefit and end up in our own happy, result in our own happiness, which is why that pursuit of virtue actually is something that uh, um, is why Stoics pursue virtue over pursuing happiness. Because if you were to pursue happiness, then maybe you wouldn't necessarily have that equation that I just laid out. Right. You know, uh, recently we've also been talking about the, uh, the benefits of simple language or speaking simply. And, you know, there's a, uh, the center of the chapter also here uh, mentions, uh, Donald mentions that Sextus was another influence uh, on Marcus about speaking frankly and helping others. Um, this could be why Donald's, I'm sorry, this could be why Marcus's meditations, this diary to himself, uh, maybe that's why it's so popular today because it has that kind of a simplicity of language and uh, of course the introspective qualities. Maybe that's why it's so readable today. It's so readable and so applicable. And I, I think in the sense that it's something that's practical because when language, when you start to, uh, and that's where the sophists were more important, you know, more focused on the idea of sounding eloquent than actually the focus on virtue or their behavior themselves. So I think that that was, you know, speaking simply makes this a practical philosophy of life, which is really what attracted me to Stoicism. Well, very good. Um... We've added a lot of people to the room. We're going to go to the discussion next. Uh, but I do want to invite people who are watching us on YouTube that uh, we'll be back next week with the other half of chapter three. There's a lot of other interesting things to, um, uh, to learn from here. And again, this is the book, uh, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor by Donald Robertson. So see you again next time. Subscribe to this channel to hear about new videos. Follow us on social media for more info. Visit StoicDan.com.